All right, our next topic here in our quick review series, uh, we're going to go over muscle disease. This will be a fairly short uh, review. And so last time we went over the big picture of the neuroaxis from the cortex of the brain all the way out to muscle. And so we're going to go through these quick reviews, starting with muscle and working our way up. So from last time, we said muscle diseases are characterized by proximal weakness. We'll see there are some exceptions to this, but that's the general rule. These do not involve upper or lower motor neurons. So there are no upper or lower motor neuron findings. And the problem is in the muscle itself, not with the sensory nerves. So sensation is normal. And a good screening test for uh, a muscle disease is the creatine kinase enzyme which will be elevated in any muscle disease where there's significant breakdown. If it's a kind of a slow chronic process like myotonic dystrophy, for example, uh, even though that is a muscle disease, your creatine kinase um, can be normal um, with, with that example. If it's a more active breakdown, it'll always be elevated. All right, so let's start with a couple inflammatory myopathies, polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Both of these tend to present with subacute weakness, so that's generally over weeks to a few months. Again, it's more proximal muscles. And because the esophagus has skeletal muscle, these patients can have some dysphagia as well. But fortunately, respiratory failure is um, extremely rare with both of these conditions. So about a third of patients can have some myalgias, but it seems to me most board questions usually include some achy muscle pain along with that. And because this is quite active, you know, it's presenting over a few weeks or a few months, the creatine kinase is going to be significantly elevated in both of these conditions. Now, particularly for dermatomyositis, there is a significant increased risk of cancer, about five to time, seven times increased um, ovarian and, and some others. Uh, mechanism is probably antigenic uh, similarity between what's going on in the muscle and the um, uh, cancer. So both conditions respond to steroids. Now polymyositis, uh, of course we always do a muscle biopsy mainly to rule out other things. And so the uh, biopsy finding in polymyositis is um, not specific. So we do see lymphocytes in invading uh, individual muscle fibers, okay, but as we'll see, that's not the very specific, specific finding that we see in dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis also has some other more specific clinical features, right? So the heliotropic rash here we can see involving the cheek, the eyelids, oftentimes there's a little swelling around the eyelids and the eyes as well, that's called periorbital edema. Um, we can see along the extensor surfaces some um, dermatologic manifestations. Here are some of the Gotrans papules, which we tend to see over the knuckles and the dorsum of the hand. Okay, and as I mentioned, muscle biopsy in dermatomyositis is very specific. So this is called perifascicular atrophy. We can see out here around the periphery um, significant involvement in comparison to the healthy muscle fibers um, here in the center, the fascicle. So perifascicular atrophy, that's the, that's the wording. That's what you're looking for when you get a muscle biopsy um, to confirm dermatomyositis. Now, inclusion body myositis is also an inflammatory myopathy, but very different. It's more slowly progressive. And think of older men that get this. And the muscle groups that are weak are quite distinctive. So it's quadriceps. Maybe not surprising, that's a proximal muscle. And so when you have quadriceps weakness, um, then the patient will describe that their knees buckle. They just don't have that stability there. And so they fall. But interestingly, in the upper extremities, it's not the proximal muscles. It's down in the hands with finger flexion. So that combination, an older man with quadriceps and finger flexor weakness, that's inclusion body myositis. And so a complaint, if you have finger flexor weakness, would be difficulty opening jars, using tools, things like that. So again, we can see dysphagia in IBM, just like we do with poly and dermatomyositis. And unfortunately, there's no treatment for inclusion body myositis. Now, in recent years, there is an antibody test uh, 
Um, but on muscle biopsy, this condition gets its names because of the inclusion bodies. So we can see here these rimmed vacuoles, and if we do electron microscopy, we can see um, these, um, they're very specific, 15 to 21 nanometer tubulofilamentous inclusions. Now, moving into the muscular dystrophy category, um, I think there are two in particular that would be high yield. The first is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The milder form, you know, we, we call these dystrophinopathies, Duchenne's and Becker's. So in Duchenne's, we have uh, really a complete absence of um, dystrophin, and there's some present in uh, Becker's muscular dystrophy. So it's, they're both X-linked recessive, and so in the case of Duchenne's, it's younger boys that are coming down with symptoms, but quite rapidly progressive. So on average, death is mid-teens or 20, early 20s. So the presentation here of uh, Duchenne's is uh, we can see some lumbar lordosis, which is quite common, a lot of weakness here of proximal muscles, and uh, the student who drew this, I asked her to highlight the calves, which we can see here in blue, are quite large. So calf hypertrophy is a distinctive feature in uh, Duchenne's. Uh, we can see also here when this boy is sitting, the kind of a significant uh, kyphoscoliosis, which is common. So the distinctive way that uh, these boys with Duchenne's rise from the floor is using the Gower sign. So they have strong plantar flexion of the feet. So they're going to use those to help them stand up. And they're also going to use their proximal arms. So they'll push their arms up like this, and then they'll move their arms up to their thighs to kind of walk up their thighs to stand up. Okay, so if you're seeing a, a young boy with weakness, um, you just ask them, lie down on the floor and let me watch you get up. And if they get up in this sort of a manner, um, that's the Gower sign and would be consistent with Duchenne's. So here's the calf hypertrophy in Duchenne's. So on average, by age 10, they need long leg braces in order to stand. Most boys are in wheelchairs by the age of 12, and death is usually due to respiratory failure. Again, around 20 is kind of a, a ballpark uh, number there. So again, this is a dystrophinopathy here. So the protein dystrophin is an important link between uh, the actin and the membrane, the sarcolemmal membrane here. And so in particular with muscle activity, um, if you don't have dystrophin, then the muscle fibers tend to break down. Myotonic dystrophy is the most common adult muscular dystrophy. And so again, it's unfortunate there's so many exceptions which can make things difficult to remember, but these patients have distal weakness. So it's a muscle disease but weakness is more distal. So these patients have foot drop and hand weakness, and they have a very classic facial appearance. So we can see temporalis atrophy, um, ptosis here, uh, facial weakness, so often we'll have kind of an open mouth appearance. And if you were to ask someone with myotonic dystrophy to smile, um, they would have a very weak smile because of the facial um, weakness. All right, so we can do genetics testing here to uh, confirm um, the diagnosis. Uh, whoops, this is actually for the um, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy where they have uh, a deletion usually at XP21. So this is what we see in Duchenne's. Um, but coming back to myotonic dystrophy, the name myotonia is an inability to quickly relax a muscle once it's contracted. And so that is usually part of the story that would really sort of in your mind confirm that this is a, a myotonic disorder. So we can check this in several ways. Grip myotonia is where you have the patient squeeze your fingers tightly and then try to let go quickly. And they can't do that. The muscle will stay tight for several seconds as they try to pry their fingers open. Or you can ask them to close their eyes tightly and then open them quickly, and they can't just do that uh, quickly. So those are examples of myotonia. We can also percuss muscles to induce myotonia. And so we can tap over the thenar eminence in the thumb and with your reflex hammer, and the thumb will elevate. It will kind of stay in a contracted position. Or you can even tap the tongue. And so this is called the napkin rings sign here, where you tap the tongue and it gets tight right in the area where you um, percussed.
So there are a lot of manifestations, um, non-neurologic manifestations of myotonic dystrophy. And so, um, again, they have ptosis and cataracts. Cataracts are very common. So we're usually sending these patients to ophthalmologists to take care of that. There's usually early uh, frontal balding. I mentioned the temporalis wasting. They can have a testicular atrophy and other endocrine um, issues. Again, the weakness is more distal in the hands and feet. And cardiac conduction disturbances are also, um, I wouldn't say common, but certainly if you have a patient with myotonic dystrophy who is experiencing syncopal episodes, it would be really important that you get that patient to a cardiologist. Um, they likely need a pacemaker because of these conduction disturbances. All right, so myotonic dystrophy here, the genetics of this is that this is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. Okay, and so there are three common trinucleotide repeat disorders that it would be common board questions in neuroscience. Myotonic dystrophy, which is a CTG re trinucleotide repeat on chromosome 19, um, Huntington's disease, as we'll see, and uh, Friedrich's ataxia. Okay, so we'll kind of repeat those several times here as we go through um, our lectures. All right, some iatrogenic myopathies. So in other words, you give a patient a medication or do something that causes a muscle disease. And so the statins, which are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, um, usually cause more of a muscle pain, myalgias, um, more so than weakness, but they can cause quite profound weakness in, in some cases. So you need to be aware of that if you're prescribing uh, statins uh, to patients. AZT, which is used to treat HIV, can cause a myopathy and chronic steroid use. And so um, I think high yield here would be to, to be aware of the very common side effects of the um, chronic use of steroids. And so uh, the mind can be affected. Personality changes, irritability, sometimes even a euphoria and insomnia um, occur when we place a patient on high-dose steroids. Of course, we get a round uh, moon face appearance. The thin skin gets very thin and bruises easily. Um, we can have um, oftentimes some weakening of the bones, osteoporosis, and wound healing um, can be affected. Um, in women in particular, there can be irregular periods and unwanted hair growth. Uh, of course, fat deposits on the back. Men may have gynecomastia and hyperglycemia. So especially if we have a patient who has diabetes, you'd really worry about putting that patient on steroids because that's going to um, make it much more difficult to manage um, their glucose. Okay, so steroids chronically do cause um, or can cause proximal muscle weakness, a myopathy, but usually it's in the context of all these other um, things that are going on. All right, metabolic myopathies, um, not very common, but these are quite distinctive because they're brought on by exertion, because the problem is with the metabolic machinery in the muscles. And so um, these often occur in young individuals. So when they're exerting themselves, like a football practice, something like that, they will have episodes that are rather intense with weakness and pain. And because of the muscle breakdown, we have myoglobinuria. So myoglobin from muscle um, is toxic to the kidney. And so these patients can have renal failure um, if they have a real um, severe episode. And so you'd want to hear that story of episodic weakness and muscle pain. And in myoglobinuria, that changes the color of the urine. It becomes dark, like a Coca-Cola colored urine. All right, so if you have those these recurrent episodes, then you're dealing most likely with a metabolic myopathy. And so I'll just mention here the most common one, which is carnitine palmitil transferase 2 deficiency. So if you just have someone with their current rhabdomyolysis, um, put that at the top of the list. It's usually after at least 30 minutes of exercise, presents in young individuals. And if you can do it during the uh, episode in particular, your creatine kinase is going to be really elevated. This can be confirmed by genetics testing. I don't think it's high yield enough to know exactly what that genetics testing is. And there are behavioral modifications like more frequent meals, um, carbohydrates prior to exercise. Um, you know, you wouldn't want someone like this out in 100 degree weather 
you know, trying to play football or, or something like that. All right, then we have myopathies due to electrical disturbances. And I didn't used to talk about this one, but now it shows up on the um, item analysis for step one and step two boards. And that is hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I think this is the only electrolyte disturbance you should know about um, as it relates to muscle disease. So these are autosomal dominant, so you look for family history. And the problem here is an abnormal skeletal muscle sodium channel. Okay, so we can actually do testing for that. And so patients present with these episodes that usually start maybe in teenage years where they have significant weakness. Again, it's a muscle disease, so it's more in proximal muscles. And the most common trigger um, that I've seen certainly is a high carbohydrate meal. And so it's often a pasta meal at dinner, they go to bed, and then they wake up weak or even paralyzed. Um, and so uh, physical activity could trigger that as well. All right, but if you got that story, um, it's probably hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And that could be confirmed by during the episode. So the, you know, during the first episode, frequently that person is gonna be brought to the emergency room. So you check their potassium level and it's really low. Um, and so these episodes are quite severe and can last for hours. Fortunately, the bulbar musculature, so talking and swallowing is normal, and respiratory muscles are relatively preserved so they don't have respiratory failure. Um, you know, if the potassium is really low, there would be some risk of cardiac arrhythmias. And so our treatment for this is going to be with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or potassium uh, sparing uh, diuretics. So the biggest thing in the differential here would probably be sleep paralysis. Okay, we will eventually get to narcolepsy, but um, patients with narcolepsy will often have intrusion of the REM period of sleep into wakefulness. And so as they're waking up, they have muscle uh, paralysis. And so narcolepsy, you have a lot of other things that would distinguish it from hypokalemic um, periodic paralysis. But those would be two conditions that would um, commonly result in paralysis on awakening. Sleep paralysis is pretty brief. So attacks of hypokalemic periodic paralysis would tend to last quite a bit longer. Okay, and then our last condition here is critical illness or ICU myopathy. And so this is common. About a quarter of patients who are in the ICU for a long period of time, um, this can sometimes overlap with a neuropathy. So we can call this a critical illness polyneuromyopathy. So it may not just be purely muscle that is involved. And so the, the common theme with these patients is uh, they usually have some sort of respiratory or pulmonary disease. And it's usually sepsis. And if patients are given neuromuscular blocking agents and steroids, they seem more likely to develop this ICU myopathy. And so uh, the story is usually a really sick patient. Maybe they've been in a coma for a period of time and they're treated for their sepsis. They're coming out of it. And um, as they come out of it, they have diffuse weakness. It may be in more proximal muscles, but they're profoundly weak throughout. If the peripheral nerves are involved, they may have some loss of reflexes and sensory changes. So again, can overlap with a polyneuropathy as well. So usually the diagnosis is fairly obvious, but uh, we would check creatine kinase, which should be elevated. We can do an EMG, which would confirm uh, muscle disease. And if you do a muscle biopsy, interesting ICU myopathy, there's a selective destruction um, of the myosin fibers. All right, so I think those are the highlights of muscle disease.